Hello and welcome to the virtual lecture Lost Without a Trace. Now this is the third of a series of talks I've given over the last few years on the Siege of Haddington. Now my name is John Cooper and I'm a Battlefield archaeologist and a PhD student at the Centre for Battlefield Archaeology at Glasgow University. In 2008 I submitted a dissertation for my MLIT for conflict archaeology looking at the location and design and fortifications and siege works around Haddington. Since then, we've gathered together a team of local historians under the acronym SHRG or SHRUG, that's the Siege of Haddington Research Group, who have been busy investigating all things relating to the Great Siege. Now this has re resulted in a number of lectures, talks and walks, seminars and articles on various aspects of this complicated narrative. Now this particular presentation was first aired in early 2020 BC, before Covid, and looks at how the English set about building the fortress from scratch and how the French rose to the challenge of flattening the English fort. More importantly, we look at how this process determines what we may find in any future archaeology. Now we don't really have time to take a good look at the politics and the history of the siege itself. That's covered off and other presentations. And if you're interested, I would recommend you have a look at Gervais Phillips' Anglo-Scots Wars, which will give you a full appreciation of the military campaign from 1548 to 1549. However, we do need to briefly consider what the English were thinking of when they chose the town of Haddington to be their main base in Scotland. So how can we describe the problem that faced the English after the death of Henry VIII and at the beginning of the Regency of Protector Somerset, Edward Seymour. It's an ongoing feud with their neighbours in Scotland. Well, think of it this way. Imagine the scenario that you live next door to a very awkward and noisy neighbour. You're always arguing about who owns what land and who is responsible for cutting the hedge and those noisy parties and the cars blocking the driveway. Sometimes you've even come to blows about the most mundane of things. However, you realise that things have to change and the kids are growing up and you need to set a good example. In fact, the kids may be the way of winning the neighbours over. They're both about the same age, they like the same things and they could actually benefit from each other's company. And you never know how things might just work out on the long term, romantically. However, the only one problem is that the daughter next door is smitten by a French exchange student and sharing tweets and FaceTiming and all that kind of stuff. And there's even word that they may be heading to France for the summer holidays. What you need is some kind of plan to persuade her parents to scrap the school trip and opt for a staycation, which would encourage the romance. That way, the families can really get to know each other learn their little ways, become more understanding and generally get along. And maybe one day you can get rid of the fence altogether and share the gardens. So the plan you come up with is pretty drastic, but it might just work. What you'll do is camp out in their garden. It all sounds a bit extreme, but it may just work. Well, it may not go well, initially, especially after the recent suspicious demise of the next door neighbour's cat, but they'll get used to you being there, I'm sure. As for the accommodation, what you need is some form of pop-up tent, just big enough to accommodate one or two of you, and of course the kids, and we could put it near the fence, so just in case we need to beat a hasty retreat for any reason, nothing too flash, good value for money, temporary, nothing really permanent, one of those newfangled things that pop up in an instant. Oh yes, and we'd better hire a new guard dog, just to sleep with you, just in case the neighbours get a bit narky and get more physical again. So off to the shops to get hold of a suitable tent, a few supplies and Bob's your uncle will be on our way. So this about sums up the thinking behind Somerset's plans for Scotland. If he could pitch his tent, or in this case, build a fortress, on the doorstep of the Scottish government, 
in Edinburgh and in effect get to know his neighbours and work with them and then maybe he could persuade them to unite the countries in marriage. What he needed was a nice pop-up fortress from which to operate from. So where do you go if you want one of these pop-up fortresses? Well, probably where all the action is. And in the early 16th century, the best place to go was the Mediterranean, where the Italians and the Spanish had been fighting against the Moors and the Turks for decades. And they'd been coming up with a whole new idea about how to build, man and position these new forts. We've also got to remember this is the age of the Italian Renaissance. So what was good for the Roman legionnaires would probably good for, be, be good for modern day forces. So those Romans were making their way into alien territories such as Germania and Gaul and Britain, taking with them their camps, their towns, and eventually building whole walls across the country. And, uh, and the Italians were learning from their experiences. Now, the Italian way of doing things, the trace Italian, the Italian plan, slowly drifted across Europe. And further the west it went, the more intricate became these trace Italian forts. And we see the development of forts in the Low Countries and perhaps best typified in the fortifications at a place like Boulogne in Calais. Now there were some der derivations. I mean King Henry VIII had his own idea about designing new artillery forts and the south coast of England is lined with King Henry's ideas. Um, so but basically there are plenty of advice out there for any would-be designers. What you needed to do is get yourself a good engineer on board. So what exactly did you get when you hired one of these new engineers from Italy? Well you certainly get a good deal of knowledge with you. These guys were pretty experienced. They came with a whole bunch of design skills. They were good project managers most important, I suppose, you wanted a guy with a good reputation, somebody you could turn around to and say, hey, yeah, my forts have been under attack and they've done what they needed to do. So this experience of an under combat conditions may be an asset to you. And with the engineers, you would probably come with a plethora of plans and maps and maybe manuals. Whoever came along had to be able to lead a workforce and, to, and show them what needed to be done. Now, as you can see from this list, there are plenty of names out there which could be hired in one way or another to help you build your pop-up Trace Italian Fortress. The ones in red at the top of the page are all those who are active before the building of Haddington in 1548. So you can see there is plenty of talent to be able to be called upon, including one name you probably recognize first and foremost, and that's Niccolo Machiavelli had written his art de la guerra in 1521. So there's some top names out there who could, if on to push, come along and help you build the thing. But more importantly, these are the guys who are disseminating their plans, their ideas, and teaching other engineers to be able to build these new trace Italian forts. So what happens if you couldn't afford one of these great men to come and help you build your fort? How do you get hold of their ideas? Well, what you could do is get get a, a copy of one of the best selling guides, a Haynes Manual of Fort Building, you might say. Books and manuscripts that included sections on fortifications have begun to appear after the publication of Leon Battista Alberti's De Rea ad Victoria of 1485. Architectural theorists such as Antonio Avellino, known as the Filarte, and Francesco Di Giorgio um, had in included fortifications in their theses in architecture. Nicola Mach Machiavelli published The Art of War in 1520s, as we said, but he was against the dependence of fortified cities and in favour of a citizen's army, taking the fight out into the battlefields rather than behind the walls of fortifications. So the science of fortification was a branch of mathematics and of art. And such artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo discussed the formation of fortified cities. These were largely in the form of fragmentary sketches and not particularly in theses. 
Albrook Dürer, notably, was well suited to developing fortifications based on geometrical principles. And many of his illustrations you'll see in the background feature of futuristic defenses of towns and cities. Now, a good example of one of these theses is written by Paul Ives in 1589. Now, that might be some 40 years after the siege of Haddington, but it appears Ives had gathered together many of the theses of the time and put them into one easy to read manual, the dummy's guide for fort building. But more importantly, it's in English, so it's easy to interpret. Just by looking at the index itself, we can see a range of skills and knowledge that was needed to build one of these fortifications. We have chapters which look at the placing of the forts in the landscape, the use and design of the fortifications in all sorts of ground, whether it's located by a river or in the mountains or by the sea. He then discusses the intricates of laying out the fort on the ground chosen and how to set about digging the ditches. Each section of the fort is described in diagrams, and this is easier to show in a literate work foreman what he needs to do. Every detail is covered from the location of hidden latrines to the size and shape of the turf blocks needed to line the walls. You can imagine Palmer and Brend having one, uh, one of a, a copy of this manual tucked into his shirt of his waist belt and, and then tore, as he toured the works of Haddington, showing the workers what needed to be done and how to do it. However, for the modern archaeologist, it provides an important reference showing dimensions and layout of the potential archaeological record that may be out there. So what exactly is Trace Italian? And why is it so effective against cannon? Well, the best example of the development of fortifications in the 16th century is actually at Tantalon Castle on the, the East Lothian coast, uh, not far from Haddington. Um, now, Tantalon Castle, defenders of Tantalon Castle for centuries were able to rest easy behind the towering curtain wall and behind the climbable cliff faces. The only real threat would be from the use of siege engines, catapults used to lob stone balls at the walls, battering rams maybe, or assault towers, and, and miners being able to digging mines underneath the walls and being able to undermine the foundations and bring the high walls and towers crashing down. Any infantry assaulting the castle would have to go across a moat, a ditch, and then scale huge walls. The taller and thicker the stone wall, the better the resistance it was to the siege engines, hence the massive curtain wall at Tantalon Castle. However, gunpowder changed all that. Artillery allowed the attacker to batter the walls with iron cannonballs with the, with the added extra immunity from firing from a greater distance. As Machiavelli pointed out, artillery may not be able to hit an individual soldier on the battlefield, but could hit a target the size of the proverbial barn door, or in this case, the tall walls, which were an easy target. So as a defender, now what was needed was to push back the enemy cannon to a range where they could not effectively hit the important buildings being protected by the wall. Now, if you reduce the profile of the target, and minimize the damage caused by the iron cannonball hitting masonry. Now, the best means of doing this was to drop the fortification into the ground. How do you do that? Well, what you do is you dig yourself a ditch in front of the wall you're trying to protect. This meant that any attacker would still need to climb ladders to surmount the wall, but they'd also have to climb down into the ditch in the first place. The stone walls themselves could be replaced by dirt, the dirt that's taken out of them when you're digging the ditch. So not only did this require less skilled masons, but it also meant that the cannonball hitting the wall would simply embed itself into the dirt rather than shattering the stone and masonry of the old forts. Any damage could easily be repaired just by simply adding more soil. So as we see at Tantalon, a new set of fortifications were added a low wall and ditch, what was known as a forewalk or forewall, was created. And this effectively pushes the attacker out of range of the main wall and presents a smaller target as possible to any attacking gunners. But still, 
what they did at Tantalum was they added a third layer of fortification, which was added in the form of an angled bastion protruding from the base court and bristling with cannons. So this provided a gun platform in which the enemy artillery can be engaged by the defending artillery. Now, ditches built in front of these, had, um, these banks of earth means that any attack now needed to drop down 30 foot into a ditch before scaling a 60 foot wall. So that's a lot of ladders that are required. But Hannington is a completely different situation to Tantalum. What we've got to do is look at what Haddington looked like in the 16th century. Now, we can do this with, uh, with these particular diagrams. So, so that's Haddington today, as we know and love it from Google Earth, and we can see all the suburbs to it. Now, if we take away all the modern or post 16th century stuff, we can work out what Haddington looked like. And I'm afraid it's not that impressive. There's only a couple of high streets and kind of necessary buildings which need surrounding. Um, first and foremost, there's no actual defences for Haddington itself. There's no real town wall at this stage. All we get is the wall which is at the bottom of the gardens, which is maintained by, by the owner of the house. This becomes like a, a boundary, a trade boundary rather than a defensive position. We have the old ports guarding the, the main entrances in, but these are not well maintained and the gates are falling off the hinges a bit, so there's not much really to say where we can put our fort. It's a greenfield site. There is no fortified positions that can be recognised. To an extent when, when the English turn up, they complain to the to, um, protector Somerset, Brandon Palmer, right back saying, we can't even, there isn't a place for us even to, to lay our heads here because there's no building which is substantial enough to provide a degree of protection. In fact, the only two buildings that could be considered were St. Mary's, which lay outside the town itself, and the toll booth, which was falling to bits a bit, but it was the best position and that's where the engineers set up their camp. Okay, the other problem is Haddington had been visited by the English before. They, they knew about Haddington. In 1544 they had actually retreated back to the border through Haddington. In the process of doing that they even set fire to the place. Now we're not sure how much damage was done during that particular raid but it does go to prove that the place could be taken quite readily and the English were familiar with the layout of the town. The biggest problem about Huntington, of course, is in the middle of enemy territory. There's no way the Scots and the French would just allow the English to move in and have all the time they needed to, to create a wonderful fortification. Everywhere you go, every time you move outside the castle, uh, the fortification of the town of Hanging, you there is a threat, there is a risk that you'll be attacked by the enemy. Perhaps the less obvious um, problem uh, to, to people passing through Haddington, especially today, is that Haddington actually sits in a bowl, sits in a saucer, you could just be described. Um, it sits nicely on the flat plain, there's the River Tyne running by it, there's some wonderful arable land around it. It's great if you're just going to do farming and trading and all that kind of thing, but from a military perspective, Haddington is very vulnerable, especially in the age of gunpowder, because now the hills around Haddington can be used to site the artillery, and those artillery pieces, pieces can actually fire directly into town, and there's not much you can do about it. Haddington is also a long way from English supply bases. If they landed stuff in Abilady, for example, they would still have to move those supplies across the hills. If they moved stuff from Berwick, they had to move it up the road into Linton and then come down into Haddington. Those long supply chains, especially in enemy territory, were prone to being disrupted. The other issue they had, which they had kind of thought about, was how, um, how readily they would be accepted by the population of Haddington. The locals, as they say, may be restless. This could just be insubordination, this could be unwillingness to help out with the planning, this could be um, a little bit of sabotage here and there, or it could be an outright um, insurrection with the garrison being overwhelmed by the local population. So they had to be very careful how they manipulated and how they coerced the locals into helping them build this fortification. 
And I suppose the worst possible scenario, the worst thing in this whole scenario is that the, the uh, English simply didn't know how long it would be before the French and Scottish army would arrive at the gates of the town. They had no idea how long they would take to build their fort and they had no idea how long it was before it would be challenged in combat. So where can we go to find out more information about how the English built the fort at Haddington? Well, perhaps the best source is from the very men themselves who were building it in the first place. Now, these guys wrote copious mass of letters back to their commanders, providing an update on the construction of the fort and the progress of the siege. Many of these letters have been captured in the various calendars of state papers which can now be found in many of the national libraries. They contain transcripts of letters between the English protagonists and their commanders. It details some of the more mundane aspects of the work, including the building of fortifications, provisioning the numbers of men, the garrison, the morale, and often asking for more money, and listing various people who were effectively engaged in the siege. So it's to these sources that we'll re refer to in the coming slides. Now, one of the more unusual problems we face when we study the siege of Haddington is that there is no plan for the fortifications we know of. Comments in the state papers say that plans were drawn up. Somerset himself was showed Odette de Selve, who was the uh, main man for the French court in London. He showed him a plan of Haddington and said, what a wonderful fortification this is. Those plans have gone missing and none have survived to the present day that we know of. We do know there were plans made of Lauder, of Broughty Ferry, and Eymouth. So we can use these to compare their descriptions with what we find at Haddington. However, we do have one particular description this was done by a guy called Jean de Boge. And Jean de Boge was a um, captain of the French army. And he was serving as aide de camp to Count de S, who was the French commander. And you can imagine de Boge coming over the horizon, taking a look at the fortifications for the very first time and scribbling down in his notepad what the place looked like. Unfortunately, he didn't draw a picture but what he did produce was a picture in words. And it's included in a book called The Lamp of Lothian, which was written at a later date about the history of Haddington. Now, the problem, of course, is de Boge wrote this thing in French. And what we see now in Lamp of Lothian is a translation of an old, from old French into old Scottish. So there could be some problems with that. But it's quite a detailed account, and we'll, we'll just run through the first paragraph here. The fortress of Hadding was quadrangular. It was on Virand with a large flat bottom ditch, a strong curtain of turf, a spacious rampart, and a good and safe breastwork. Four strong bastions were conveniently placed on the four corners of the wall, and they were designed in lieu of so many platforms to keep weak places from being discovered. Behind these bastions, towards the most champagne country, several works of earth were raised by way of platforms and ravelins, which English planted many great guns of a middle size to annoy the French as they sat down before the place. Above these fortifications was a curtain of fascines with reared up, on which the arquebusiers of the English stood secure. Behind and over and against the rampart of the first war was a deep fosse or a ditch or moat, bordered with a strong curtain, four turrets which fenced and enclosed the dungeon. And between the edge of the fosse and the curtain of the dungeon was a very many casements, close to and level with the first rampart, in which arquebusiers might be placed for guarding the second fosse. And so the description goes on. And even just listening to that short extract, you would have realized it's a very complicated and a, and a bit of wordy 
explanation as to what we're looking at. Trying to construct a picture from these words is really difficult. We need a little help. So what we do is we go into the sources and we find every snippet of information, every passing sentence of which the uh, observers had made comment about the state of the fortifications. They may not have even meant to make the comment, it's just in passing. But if we can combine all these little snippets, these little gobbets of information, then we can have a better view of what this fortification looked like. However, back to our diaries, our state papers. What is it that they are telling us? Well, first of all, they describe Gray and Palmer getting to work at Haddington straight away. On the same day they arrive in the town, they're out there looking around the place and looking where best to lay the lines. The following day, they go out there with pieces of string and they start measuring out the lines of the fortifications. COSP 228 gives us a good clue. It says the line of the fortifications surround the uh, main buildings of the town, what is described as the substance of the town and the fair houses which are contained within it. Sufficient for any garrison, that is to say, they're going to use those nice big houses as accommodation for the garrison going forward. In the same letter, Gray comments on things we've already discussed. He worries about the amount of work that needs to be done. The site is Greenfield site, there's nothing there for them to, to go on. The site is overlooked by the hills, he says, and that's a problem because of the artillery will be able to attack from those hills. He also discusses the infidelity of some friends. Now what he's talking about there is the, the assurance, the assured Scots in towns and whether he could trust them to help with the construction of the fortification. There's also the scarcity of victuals. That means there's not enough supplies in the town to sustain the garrison or the workforce. We must get something in. And of course, it's all being threatened by the enemy. This is enemy held territory and he's worried that any supplies coming in would be intercepted. Gray fears that there's about 5,000 Scots who could, as he puts it, beat the English from their trenches. The statement could be true. And what he's worried about is the Scots coming right close to the town and to be able to take on the English before any of these fortifications have been built. The fact that he's considering building trenches before he builds the walls themselves is an indication that they must defend the town the best they can with what they've got as fast as possible. Notably, on the 21st of May, Somerset replies back. Now, Somerset is not sitting idly listening to the news reports coming in. He is willing to give his opinion about the building of this new fort, his new fort. And he suggests on the 21st of May to take down the Church of Haddington, suggesting that they should work to clear the buildings out with of the fort, and that this is still to happen. Even by the 21st of May, buildings like St. Mary's, buildings out with the fortifications themselves, was still standing, and that was something that the English would, would have to concentrate on. Now, the actual logistics for this construction were absolutely mind-blowing. Remember, the English had to procure or bring in a massive selection of specialised tools and equipment, especially for building these new fortifications. They also needed men, men who were capable of using this equipment. Now, all, on paper, all this had to be brought in from England. However, there was a chance to strip the local area and use local Scots to help to build the fort. As the days went by, convoys and stores were moved along the road from, to and from Berwick. Work parties scoured the local area, felling the copses and woods for timber. Food stores were not only built, but filled from local products. And all this needed money, and it was held in the coffers at the toll booth. Now, you would think digging a ditch and building a mud wall was a simple enough process, 
However, the Italians thought differently. and They made it into a fine art. It's quite ironic. I'm actually sitting here at the moment with uh, Carla Holmes building a new uh, estate at the bottom of our garden. And there is a bulldozer pushing around mounds of heavy earth and trying to flatten the place out. Um, it's amazing that modern technology is even having difficulty coping with such a task. Imagine what it was, must be like in the 16th century. You might be able to hear the sound of the dozer in the background, which I apologize for. Although, back to business. And one of the best descriptions of mid 16th century earthwork technology is to be found in the treatise of a guy called Giovanni Battista Baluzzi, who had supervised the construction of ramparts at Pistoa in the 1540s. Now, Baluzzi describes a, a composite timber brushwork and earth structure built in the following manner. First, a framework of heavy timber uprights were pile driven into the bottom of the foundation trench. Then rubble and solid earth would be rammed down in between, followed by cross pieces of timber. The cross pieces and diagonals appeared as a continuous chain, which was indeed known as the catena or chain by the engineers. Then faggots, now that's bundles of long twigs bound together, would be laid in layers across the rampart and built up in front and rear into retaining walls. The earth would then be mixed in with light brushwood and consolidated between the fascines and the faggots. The brushwood again acting as a kind of reinforcing mesh. Layers of clay and logs would be introduced from time to time to form a damp proof la layer and add a bit more stability. Finally, the whole structure would be protected from the weather by a, a layer of planking of wood and a layer of turf. And the turf is well pegged into the sloping surfaces. One of the problems they would have is that if the slope was too steep, the turf would just simply fall away under rain and bad weather. A rampart of this kind was stable enough to support the heaviest of guns and was capable of absorbing a great deal of enemy shot. Things could, of course, go horribly wrong if, for one reason or another, corners were cut. For example, the fortifications at Broughty Ferry had a tendency to slip away as they were built with a good proportion of sand. The sand castle tended to be washed away with the rain. The English sent ships filled with lime up to the fort, which was then dug into the ramparts so as to act like a cement and bond the sand together. So much of this dirt was constructed by trial and error. But what it does mean for the archaeologists is we know what we're looking for when we find traces of these structures in the landscape. But then it kind of gets a bit more complicated. It's not just building ditches any old place. Let's go and revisit what Boje has to say about the defences at Haddington. Let's get that up. We go back and read some of the, the, the detail of it. So he's talking about a quadrangular fortress. That seems quite simple. And it's environed by a large flat bottom ditch. And then there's a strong curtain and there's bulwarks and bastions and um, platforms and ravelins and cavaliers. And there's a curtain with fascines. Um, there's different platforms that have to be done. There's trenches that have to be um, laid out. Um, and then there's an inner dungeon. There's not just one set of walls, there's two set of walls for this place and four great big massive bastions on either corner. So it's a really complicated um, piece of uh, engineering to get this thing laid out. All those angles that you see in the diagrams are all laid out to, through mathematical formula. There is a glacis, there are slopes before the main walls themselves to de deflect cannonballs. There's degrees of, of slope on the walls themselves so they can't be scrambled up with, without um, having to use a ladder. So it's all been carefully thought out and carefully planned and there are secret passages and hidden latrine pits and there are different ways out and in and out of the fortress to be used by the uh, defenders. So it's a pretty complicated piece of kit that we're trying to design here. Of course, there's more to it than just building. What we had to do is knock a few things down as well. This ridding of the ground, as it was described, 
that is to say, the destruction of all the prominent buildings outside the earthworks. This was a really serious problem for the defenders with the time and effort that was required to demolish these buildings. They had to recover any worthwhile materials and ensure that there would be nothing left standing that would provide cover or material for the opposition. Well, the biggest building to be left out with the fort was, of course, St. Mary's Church. And on a number of occasions, the English made attempts to destroy the building. They say in the calendar of state papers that the vaults and the churches, church was broken and the roof was removed and the pillars were cut and propped. Now, this is an interesting um, statement because what we see is that the English are preparing for the destruction of the church by undercutting the, the pillars and propping up the vaults. So just one explosion maybe could bring the whole thing down. However, the English simply did not have the time or the resources to do an effective job before the French arrived. They made good use of the carcass of the old church and they installed guns onto the platform which were then able to fire down onto the English positions. The English mounted cannons at the Friary Bastion in retaliation. They took out the French guns in the process of doing this. The English stated that they would hoped that they would blast away the very bolts of the church, which had already been rigged for their destruction and for the collapse and this bringing the whole fortress down, the whole church down on the head of the unfortunate French defenders. However, not, not all is well within the English ranks. Now, despite what we're seeing from what the English commanders are reporting back to Protector Somerset about the strength of the fortifications and the progress of the, the build itself, there are one or two serious flaws that only really appear once the French have arrived and the siege has begun. A letter sent by Palmer and his understudy Holcroft, who were in command uh, of the fortifications during the siege, back to Somerset on the 7th of July 1548, shows an incredible weakness in the construction of one of the main bastions and the, the bulwark next to it. Um, and it reads, the letter reads, last night, the enemy finding the outer corner of Wyndham's bulwark, there a little wall of a house, battered it down, and whereon gave a shout and assaulted both sides, but our men valiantly repulsed them, slaying a great many and one principal captain, a senior French officer. This morning it was made up that it was not seen where any goon had light. In other words, in the morning it was very quick to repair. The hole, the breach had been filled in to an extent where not even an idiot could get his way through. So. Um, what you see is this uh, an incredible admission to the fact that the walls of the bastions incorporated material that appeared to be left over from the original town wall or a town building. So much so that this simple wall could be knocked down and access gained into the fortifications themselves. This incorporation of existing buildings and walls may explain how the fortification was built in such a short time period. And what they're doing is buildings that existed in the lines of the outer defences were then simply built into the outer wall. Now, a good example of this is the Franciscan Friary precinct in the southeast corner of the fortifications. This was simply mured up. So that is to say the existing walls were backed up with mounds of earth and yet some the alleyways opening out to the Tyne, to the river Tyne were all blocked and guns were mounted on makeshift gun platforms where soil had been piled up behind existing walls and the guns could be dragged up into positions just behind those walls. Now the Scots looked upon the Franciscan precinct as a defensive structure and they called it the Franciscan bastion. Um, and a defensive structure in its own right. Although it had been clearly co cobbled together from existing material and making use of existing walls and existing buildings. So how much of the fortifications made use of these existing buildings is not exactly known. However, it could be interpreted that the inner defences surrounding the Cordelogie, or as Boger describes it, those, those necessary houses 
in the center of the town didn't actually build a new fortification at all. What they did was make good the buildings which had already existed. Imagine a line of terraced houses, although all they're doing is, put, is mirroring up the yets and alloways in between them and providing gun platforms and gun positions within the buildings themselves to fire down on the outer wall. So, so the reports also allude to other omissions in the design of the fort. Apparently, it was to be much bigger than the actual finished fort ended up being. There appears to have been another missed opportunity to make the fortifications even more effective. On the, on the 2nd of July, Palmer and Holcroft, his 2IC, write to Somerset to say that the Almains, that's the Germans, uh, German mercenaries, are beyond the bridge, the Nungate Bridge, and trenching along the waterside to the mill, which is the Gimmers Mill. And they add that the position was once fortified but abandoned by our men as untenable. Now, this suggests that the English plan to set up a garrison to the east of the river around the Gims Mill area and possibly um, involving the Nungate precinct as well, to protect the eastern approaches to the Nungate Bridge. But they simply didn't have the resources or the time to man those, man those fortifications during the siege itself. Now, there's a further comment suggests another part of the fortification was abandoned, but this time before it was even built. Palmer states that the French encountered before Lethington, that's on the west side of town, have passed the water on that side, a small stream, with seven battery pieces and nine others, and have trenched towards the heath of the hill, that's the, the crest of the hill, where, he states, the bulwark out of town was meant and mean tonight to plant their ordnance there. Now this statement again suggests that the English had plans to build a bulwark out of town, out with the fortifications of Huntington, perhaps in order to protect the, uh, the high ground immediately around the uh, western end of the town or to somehow overlook the main road into town. But they simply had no time or resources to complete this work. Now, however, despite all these inadequacies and these models in the construction of the fort, we know that the, the fort holds out. There's some interesting comments during the siege. So on the 2nd of July, Palmer writes that, now the garrison fears no ordnance as they've placed themselves in the cabinets on the ramparts, lodging in town only at need. What does that mean? Well, actually what we're finding is that the French artillery fire is not destroying the walls of the fort at all. It is causing damage to the houses on the inside, and this is forcing all those garrison troops to come over to the wall, and they're creating tents or cabinets along the defensive line of the wall in which to live. 2nd of July. The letter continues. We are informed that this day the French have battered the side towards Lethington. So that is the the west end of the town, with four or five pieces of artillery, but done not, not done much hurt. In other words, they haven't caused much damage, for they within make it up faster than they without beat it. Oh, this is a wonderful comment. This is demonstrating the resilience of these, these earthen fortifications. As soon as the cannons roar and the, the cannonballs hit the wall, they create a, a, a hole in the mud. But as soon as they do that, the, the um, the English on the inside make good the damage. The 3rd of July, Gower to Brend, he states, the French camp lies in the valley beside the mills of Huntington next to Clarkington. So this is another French camp. Their battery is placed in a little cornfield between it and Wyndham's Bulwark. Now, Wyndham's Bulwark is the southwestern bulwark for the, um, the square fortification of Huntington. But only two cannons as yet, which began to shoot at 10 o'clock this morning this day, but not at the houses, but at the vamur, i.e. the walls, the ramparts, and very often shoot over. This is, again, an indication of how difficult it was to land shot on these very uh, um, small uh, and low walls. And so often the cannonball shoots over the top and hits the houses beyond it, or deflects off the slope of the, of the embankment and ricochets over the top 
causing very little damage. But the French artillery was really effective at keeping the heads of the English down below the parapets. Now this allowed them to dig trenches towards the walls and then ditches and place guns in good positions so they could destroy the artillery pieces of the English within the fortification itself. And they came very close to succeeding in storming the, the fort by the 7th of July. By this time, they were filling the ditches in front of the, um, the walls with fascines. And that's again, these bundles of sticks. They're putting these bundles of sticks into the ditch in which then they could go across the, the ditch work. And they're preparing ladders for the assault. So this, these ladders will get them up over that final um, wall. It also notes that the mining teams have been hard at work digging into the base of the bastion. And finally, the point of the bastion has collapsed completely and the English faced an all out assault through the breach. Now, the English had to come up with a plan as to how to effectively counteract this particular collapse of the wall. And this goes to show how versatile the Trace Italian forts were. As soon as the garrison realised the, what the French were up to, they started building counter defences. So by the 13th of July, the French thought they were ready, but the English had not been idle. They had effectively countered the French progress. So according to the letter from Palmer to Holcroft uh, and to Somerset on the 13th of July, we find that the English have actively destroyed much of the French seed works, or so they say. Palmer declares that there is no longer a breach and that no flank has been taken away. And what he means by this is that the flanking guns, those that are positioned to fire along the length of the wall into the flanks of the assaulting troops, have not been destroyed by enemy counter artillery fire. He says that far from it, in fact, two French pieces, that's two French guns, have been, that have been firing at the bastion have been dismounted. And that means they've been knocked off their trunnions or carriages and effectively are unable to fire. He says a mine has been countermined. That means the English have dug another tunnel which has intercepted the French tunnel and caused that to collapse. The last part of the entry is interesting. It says that the great mount has been raised that masters their bulwark. Now what he's describing here is a small lower ditch and wall which has been built to the rear or the neck of the threatened bastion. Now the French can't see this from the outside and therefore they can't target, target it with their artillery. So the idea is that when the French assault the breach they climb up the battered outer bastion only to come up against a second wall, untouched rampart, manned with artillery and muskets which will stop their advance. The English were well prepared for the assault. However, they knew the defences were not to be tested. See, by the time the French were ready for the assault, the Scots they had hoped would lead the attack and be subsequently massacred, had come to the end of their furlough and many had left for home. Because Scottish soldiers only join the battle for around about 30 to 60 days and then they're entitled to go home. And this is what many of them had done. So without the necessary cannon fodder or and unwilling to risk their expensive mercenaries or even their own Frenchmen, the French decided to call off the attack. The fort had held out, but only just. The fortifications had not been breached and as they rest, and as they say, the rest is history. But until we find the archaeological evidence as to the construction of the walls, and bastions around Haddington. All this analysis of records and building manuals will only be speculation. What we really need is some genuine 16th century uh, siege work constructions to be able to compare with the manuals and the building plans. Fortunately for us, we don't have to go too far away to find an example of 16th century bastions and ramparts. So according to the historians, there are no traces of the fortifications of Haddington left in the landscape around the town today. Well, actually that could be debated over a pint of beer at a later date. Now that's of course is correct if we are only looking at the ditches and walls that were built. Many of those have been infilled and tarmacked over. 
However, as archaeologists, we always hold out hope that those ditches and banks can be revealed and given a suitable opportunity. Then, of course, there remains the fortified precincts, again, still visible in the lines of the roads and the boundaries, if not the buildings themselves, and the foundations of those cellars, and if not the walls themselves, of those necessary houses in the centre of the town, are still very much in situ and with us today. However, how will we recognise such fortifications should we be given the opportunity to look for them in the suburbs of Haddington? Well, fortunately, we don't have to look too far away for examples of 16th century military constructions. Located roughly halfway between the northeast port of Haddington and the Abbey is a peculiar mound set on the north bank of the Tyne opposite the Amersfield Golf Course. Much speculation has been made into the past as what this might be with a favourite explanation of mine being that it's some kind of farmer's uh, potato ramp so they can load the potatoes onto the wagons. However, preliminary excavations in 2019 suggested another explanation. So, first and foremost, the exploratory trenches demonstrated that the mound was not a natural feature caused by a river erosion, glacier, something like that. Each trench revealed a degree of terracing st uh, stonework which had been deliberately placed in order to prevent the mound from slipping away and to provide space for a flat platform. So a topographic survey of the site and drone photography and latterly some LIDAR images revealed a, a definite design to the mound. It wasn't just a pile of earth. It consists of a higher platform which seems to be orientated roughly on an east-westerly line, looking towards the west, looking towards Haddington itself. The main platform was reached by a ramp, which was in turn reached, um, reached by a gully heading towards the pathway and down to the river. Surrounding the main platform was a lower platform, which seemed to flatten out and again provide some kind of stability to the big platform itself. So it was quite a complicated structure that we had going on in the landscape. Now, naturally, the 16th century siege archaeologists, i.e. me, pursued the idea that these, this feature was some kind of gun platform built speculatively at the time of the siege. We went off and we looked at contemporary images from other sieges such as the sinking of the Mary Rose, the Cowdery print, where you can see a gun emplacement on the shores of the Solent. We've got the great siege of Boulogne and the siege of Edinburgh. And we even went to visit similar known gun platforms at Pilrig, Link, uh, Pilrig Links and Leith Links overlooking the fortifications of Leith. And they all seem to have similar characteristics. This idea of a ramp leading up to a protected flat area with a rampart, which could be then manned and positioned with fascines, and uh, which would then protect the gunners and the artillery crew from shots from the, uh, coming in at them. And then a lower platform, which could be possibly used for hackbutters or musketeers to provide a defensive cover for the, the greater platform above, for the, the gun positions behind them. So certainly the Mount Haddington seem to have very similar features to those that we were seeing in contemporary artwork. So it's possible we had a gun platform, but there was something not quite right with it. It's the location. It seemed too far away from Haddington to be of an effective use. Uh, the viewshed analysis, now that's what we do with the topographic survey. We can work out what we can see and what we can't see from any particular point on the map. The view, the view shed analysis said, yeah, of course you could see Haddington, that was fine. But when we incorporated the range of guns from the Renaissance artillery, it was only the really big guns that would effectively should be able to land a shot on Haddington itself. And even then, at that range, it would do very little damage to the fortifications itself. Was there another reason for this gun platform being in the location it was? Well, one of the ideas that was um, was put forward was that the gun platform was actually preventing um, troop movement along the main road into the northeast port of Hannington. 
Now that main road runs just slightly south of the A1 today, in very much in range of any gun that was located on the gun platform. The other idea was that this was not a position to attack Haddington, but it was a position which helped the defence of the Abbey. Remember, the Abbey, latterly in the siege, became a camp for the Scots and the French. And this gun platform was actually there to defend the Abbey, not to attack Haddington from. To add to this argument that the gun platform was actually a defensive structure protecting the Abbey, we had another look at the floodplain analysis of the area, which suggested that in the winter, and if the time ever flooded, that the area directly to the west of the gun platform would become waterlogged at most and become boggy and marshy for the rest of the year. So there was a natural defensive position between Haddington and the gun platform, which they would prevent any attackers coming in from that direction. The only way they could get out the gun platform is through coming along from the northeast area or directly into the mouth of the guns, which were mounted on the rampart. Now there is one interesting subplot to the story of this particular gun ramp. Noted in the accounts of the siege is a visit by Mary of Guise to the siege lines around Haddington. She had just signed the Treaty of Haddington at the Abbey and she decided that she wanted to take a look at the siege underway with the entourage. Now there are two accounts of what happened next. First in the Hamilton papers, written by Palmer, the commander of the English garrison, he writes to Somerset stating that the Queen went to the church from which she could view the siege underway. The assumption has always been that that church steeple that she climbed up was actually St Mary's, very, very close to the siege lines. And the English were quite capable of seeing what was happening. They spotted the entourage arrive and took, up a, couple, took a couple of shots of them with a cannon killing about 15 of the Queen's retinue and coming close to dispatching the Queen herself. However, there's a second opinion. A guy called Olpian Fulwell, now he was a playwright and poet writing in London, and he wrote uh, a text called The Flower of Fame, which was basically in honour of those Englishmen who had served in the Haddington campaign. And in his verse, he suggests an alternative narrative now he states that the Queen of Scots was visiting a nunnery, the Abbey, not the church, which was about a mile from Hannington, and it was from this location that she was spied and she was shot at. But as we have proven, the artillery guns of that period would never have been able to hit, hit anything accurately at that range. And so it's therefore been suggested that Mary was in a viewing platform halfway between the two sites when she was attacked. Could it be that Mary's lucky escape was actually at the gun platform that we had been doing the archaeology on? Now it's an interesting theory, but there's no evidence to suggest that this is actually the case. So putting all the evidence together that we have at the moment suggests that this gun ramp could look something a bit like this. So we have here terraces. We've got the guns mounted on the highest terrace, protected by a whole row of fascines, from which behind the guns and the gun crew can be protected from any incoming fire. On the lower platform, you get again another barricade of fascines, from which the musketeers and the harquebusiers could fire. So if there's any direct assault on this particular bastion, it can be defended by the fortifications lying at the foot of the ramp. So this is what we've got, this is what we think is out there, but more importantly, what we do have is an indication of the way these structures were built. So when we go and have a look for walls and fortifications in Haddington itself, we've got some idea as to the type of engineering that was being used. And finally, a bit of stop press news. Here's the latest LiDAR images that we have of the uh, the, the gun platform. You can see it's very distinctly sitting there in the bottom uh, left hand corner, the mound overlooking the fields themselves. But to the south of it, can you make out that triangular platform 
Now that is now overgrown with reeds and, and, and grass. It's really difficult to see. But if that really does exist, that is key evidence to say that what we're looking at is a trace Italian, a bastion type fortification built into the landscape. And more tantalizing is the series of ditches and ramparts running to the uh, east toward, along the bank of the river. Suggestive that this, that this could actually be just one corner of a quadrangular fortlet which defended the, um, the abbey complex, the abbey campsite. Um, and if so, this, this particular gun platform, this particular fort is much bigger than we originally suspected. So watch this space as we look to do more surveys in the area. So to conclude, when Brendan Palmer rode into Haddington in April 1548, they had little idea as to the extent of the task ahead of them. The position didn't look good. The low-lying low town, surrounded by overlooking hills, was a long way from supply depots along a very tenuous supply line. It was deep within enemy territory and the locals were not necessarily as happy to see them as they were led to believe. They had little idea as to how long they would have to build the fort, but whatever they came up with had to able, be able to withstand a siege against modern technology. They only had about a thousand men and there was a whole bunch of other tasks that needed to be undertaken. It would take a very cool head, good project management and a good plan to build this particular fort. But build it they did. Not that they managed to complete everything before the enemy pitched up. There were a number of omissions, make-dos and models. It wasn't perfect, but it had to do the trick. Trace Italian design was quick and simple to build. And when there was no time to build extensive fortifications, then existing walls and precincts could be mured up and made defensible. Existing precincts and ports could be incorporated into the design. It wasn't perfect, but it would do. And what they designed held firm. It did exactly what it said on the label. The walls were never breached and the town was never taken. What drove the English out was not the Scots or the French, but money or the lack of it. It was too expensive in men, supplies and cash to maintain. And anyway, the bird had flown the coop. Mary was already in France, living a life of leisure in the French court. Somerset's pop-up fort was no longer required. When the English left, they destroyed the place. And when Mary of Guise turned up to see the place, she said the English had left nothing but the plague. So thank you for listening to this presentation, and we hope you found it intriguing. There are many other aspects of the siege under review by the Shrubbery Siege of Haddington Research Group, and we hope to bring you more presentations in the future, hopefully face to face on location. In the meantime, please do take time to visit Haddington and take a look at the sites connected with the siege. The staff at the local museum of the John Gray Centre are more than happy to keep you on the right track and share more information about the Great Siege.